think I managed to correct the links on the home page was wrong. So I both put the paper, now it's a link to PubMed, and there was uh, the wrong slide link. So I think it should be updated now. If not, yes, let me know. And I also upload uh, because uh, there, there are links to the video from yesterday. If you want to see. Uh, if you, uh, uh, basically, all, all my videos, if you have Google for my name on YouTube, you find it. But it's, uh, it should be. Sometimes it's easier to watch things on YouTube than on the download the big file. Sometimes. Uh, but I don't think it's the same resolution. The full resolution is only on the file. But, uh, I think YouTube craps up through somehow. Probably it's okay. Uh, so today we will talk about uh, protein folding or protein structure predictions. So basically, I will try to do a little bit of more biophysics, like many things that probably some of you know if you are like biophysics by background, uh, but. Uh, Hopefully not, it's not trivial for everyone. And then I talk about what I would call protein structure predictions, the sort of methods for predicting the structure if you do not use homology. You do not use homology. Did, did, did you have a lecture about homology modeling yet? Yes. Do you know homology modeling? Then I, uh, so basically, I will talk about what. Yeah. So, but somehow actually this thing, uh, in particular, I will talk about two programs or two methods. One is I will call it fragment-based assembly, and uh, uh, it's exemplified by the program Rosetta, which is clearly the most used program in this field. But it's not the only one that there are. I will talk about more fundamental, fundamental principles of it. And then I talk about the contact predictions. I think I mentioned it when in the machine learning lecture, and I will talk a bit more about it. That's really what has changed the whole field the last five, ten years. So if you if, if, if take the, the cause of protein folding, in the way of like, I mean, we, we, we all know that most proteins, or many proteins at least, basically have the sequence. I mean, somehow, the exit in the ribosome, there is a long chain of amino acids. And then, in some mysterious way, they fold up to a structure <coughs> that you can, and then find, does some magic in the cell and does some functions. And we know that the structures are very different. And at least for exactly how this goes on, has been a bit hard. Well, has been a challenge to try to understand in details for for 50 years, probably from probably the start of the 70s. And there have been numerous claims that we understand this and we can do this and we can describe different ways to predict structures. I would say that today, actually, remember the last three months, the last six months. We actually can say that we can predict the structure of a protein dextrin sequence, but we do not we do not really do that by understanding the physics. We do it by using a lot of sequences. I come back to that. But anyway, this is a lot of experimental work. So there are a lot of questions. And my friends, the several groups up here that work on folding in the exit tunnel of the ribosome. So you know, all the ribosome is big machinery, and the protein chain is synthesized there. And of course, when it's synthesized, it's basically a long chain. But then there, there is an exit tunnel that has a sort of shape and has some parts that interact with. And of course, uh, you could imagine the protein synthesized and then falls after it. But clearly, the, 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 the synthesis takes time. And of course, biophysics is happening, so the things are happening. So some proteins really fold inside the, inside the tunnel, some fold directly outside, and some actually don't fold at all, but they need other en additional enzymes or chaperones to help the fold and so on. So to understand then that the detail is certainly not solved yet. But it's clearly, it's quite clear now that it, it already after directly a protein is partly produced and exit enzyme, some type of folding process has happened. And then there are, uh, and then there are a lot of uh, different 
different theories. So the idea, I think I mentioned here, is to kind of, I can spell the C, but uh, two kind of fundamental principles are used to, as this Amphitheon paradox, or Amphitheon's dogma and the Leopold's paradox, are, you can summarize it sort of this way. So Amphitheon, who got the Nobel Prize for folding of lysozyme, in the 70s probably, I don't know I can uh, showed that basically you can fold and unfold the protein. So by, by, you know if you boil an egg, what happens when you boil an egg? Yeah, it, it unfolds. Proteins unfold. But you can't really get it pulled back. Because you can't really get in the boiled egg to be unboiled. But it's, same, it's still the same proteins and nothing hardly anything chemical has broken, it's just that the protein unfolded and been aggregated. But if you take a much more dilute concentration of proteins and you do an unfolding, either by temperature or by adding urea or changing pH, something like that, you can get the protein unfold and then fold back. Not all proteins, but many, many small single domain protein cells you can do it. So lysosome is the classic example. So so that is the sort of Amphitheon dogma you basically have. And, and how do you explain that? Well, the explanation is that given all possible states that the protein chain can end up in, which is many, I'll come back to in a second, the lowest free energy is the native state, the full state. So basically, if you just wait long enough time, everything will uh, like end up here. So you have it will be up here. And you know, you know, you know, you know your basic thermodynamics. You have entropy and enthalpy. So certainly here you have much more entropy, much more freedom. But here you have to restrict entropy, but they're compensating. Well, I'm not sure. I mean, actually, the lowest point of energy would be the denaturation state, as we have when we boil an egg. Because when we boil an egg, we will go over a certain energetic barrier that it is in a form denaturated that it cannot be formed. That is it, it, absolutely it, the lowest well, it, form. It, it, that's probably the lowest energy state in that temperature. Because you basically, if you boil it and you increase the temperature, and the lowest free energy state in the 30 or 25 degrees, whatever the egg should be in, should, for, but it's basically light time, should basically be down here. And the point is that it, it, what happens when you boil an egg is that you get trapped up here. You get trapped, or actually you get trapped, probably can you mention next slide. You get trapped and you get completely different programs. You, you basically get trapped. You get trapped in some kind of uh, unfolded aggregate state. And at least uh, for individual protein, well, that should not. Uh, I mean, it doesn't unfold by itself at 37 degrees. So it's, uh, it, it, for single protein, the lowest free energy state is probably the default one. But then, of course, the problem is like everything, all the things are. Concentration dependent, temperature dependent, pH dependent, right, other uh, salt concentration dependent, etc. So certainly, this sort of anthrax and dogma is only valid given some sort of criteria. But my and so the, the, the egg is just highly highly concentrated, and, and, yeah, yeah. and you change the temperature and then turn false, and then it gets tra trapped. So basically, what anthrax showed is that if you take lysosome itself. That you can raise the temperature and short sure, unfolds, but it doesn't aggregate because you don't have the same concentration. So if you got unfolds on that, and then you cool it down again, you can get it to fold back. And you can show that by, by some activity and some Alright, it's, it, it, so it, 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 it's a simplification, but um, it is a, a sort of assumptions that have been used in this field for the last 50 years. And it's, but if, if, no, aggregation, concentration are too big, big factors. And so the cells are quite, uh, quite concentrated of, of, uh, of proteins. They cl clearly are a lot of, uh, I mean, a high, high, high amount of proteins in cells. This is a concentration. And there are, and aggregation as is a big problem. Basically, what you talk here, and really this type of aggregations, these amyloid fibrils, it's, it's most likely. The cause, at least in relationship to Alzheimer's and uh, well, certainly to prior diseases and so on. So, that are, so it's clearly are disease related things that are 
sort of what happens. But one theory, Alzheimer's is complicated, but I'd say it's basically you have some protein here that unfolds, that forms these fibrils, and these cannot be degraded. They are stuck in the base, your, your neurons start to die. So you start to break down killer cells. There are other, but there are some indicators that this might just be a secondary effect, but I have to see if it's some relation. So that's basically unfold. I mean, prior disease is the classical disease where you have, have this kind of unfolding. That they were actually not, well, maybe in native states it's probably not the lowest energy. You actually have a lower energy, which is how kind of the thing is that it's there. That, but you need something to trigger it. Either it can be mutation or it can be actually triggered by other proteins at all in this state that is sort of self propagating. So there are, there are other cases. So there, there, it's not, it's a clear simplification, but it's kind of useful to have this idea. No? So the Levitol paradox is basically basic because of how big is this space here? So anybody knows what it is? So if you take, uh, it's just a thought experiment, there's nothing real. But if you take a chain, you have a protein chain, and you have some side chains. Anyway, you have five side angles. So you have basically you have two variables, two tahedral angles that determine the backbone angles, and you can put here and so on. And, and do you remember this Ramachandran plot? I thought, if you don't know, you basically have like one area for here, this is one here, and a sheet, and then something in between. So you, you can assume that there are more or less three different states for each uh, mean acid pair. So you have helix, sheet, or loop. If you simplify it very much. But that would mean that if you have two, if you have only two amino acids, you only have three states. It can, can be A, B, or C. Helix sheet loop, for example. If you have three amino acids, so if you have two amino acids, this is an amino acid, and this is a state. If you have three, you have three times three. The first one can be helix and the sheet. If you have four, you have three by three by three. If you have five, you have three to the power of five. If you have a hundred, there's three to the power of hundred. And this I think is like 10 to the power of three. Right? So that's a very, very big number. So that big number is, I think, is more than that number of atoms in the universe. On that. It's, like, it's a gigantic number, 10 to the power of three. And certainly, if you would search all possible confirmations, so you would basically start the confirmation alpha, 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 and you change alpha, alpha, beta, alpha, etc. And you say you can search maybe one in each one second. It would take 10 to the 34 seconds to search this. Which is much longer than the universe has existed. So clearly, a protein does not fall by searching all confirmations. Of course, there's no time for this. Do you know how fast a protein falls normally? The, Nanoseconds is extremely fast. It's more like uh, up to microseconds or milliseconds. I mean, uh, even seconds, you know, different. It, it can take, uh, even, even, even make your protein can take almost a second. So there are, I think they made mm, per millisecond. So, I mean, it, it, it's, so it, it clearly is, it don't, it's not extremely fast. But I mean, it also varies. Bigger, more complex proteins take more time. Some do not fall spontaneously. But, it's in the order of, I mean, it's, it's, it's in order of second or less. Sorry, maybe a millisecond or a microsecond, but it's not. <coughs> so it's clear not 10 to 34 seconds, it's not years. So it default, I mean, every new, every time you make a new protein, it folds before the cell dies. And the bacteria and cell doesn't live the whole uh, So clearly, how, do, how does nature solve this problem? It does it by having guided folding. So basically, when it's produced, you start somewhere up here, not in a particular place, but then there is an immediate preference to walk towards native stage. You might get tapped with track with an intermediate somewhere, and you need a bit of energy to get out of it, but in general, you have to travel to go fall down there. So, 
Yeah. And, and yeah, this is basically you look at yeah, the photon time scale. If you go down like picoseconds, I mean, I don't know, I guess you haven't done any molecular dynamic simulations, but if you do, that, that's one way to simulate proteins, and I use folding if you would like to, is to do what's called molecular dynamics. So in molecular dynamics, we just put up an uh, energy function, a, 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 a potential that describes the interaction with each pair of atoms. You ignore the quantum effects, at least more or less, and you follow Newton's second law of equation. So basically, you calculate the forces on each atom, you iterate a very, very short time step. And, they st and then you move all the atoms a little bit, you calculate the force again, and you do that, and you do it many times. And to do it on the atomic scale, uh, you have a time step which is a femtosecond, so 10 to the minus 15 seconds, that's no matter, or two femtoseconds, or half femtoseconds, but that, that order. Uh, and that means that if you want to simulate a whole motion or a, a second of protein, you need to do it 10 to the 15 times, which is a long time. But not completely on a real wire, because you know that my telephone here does 10 to the 9 calculations each second. Or something on the order, 10 to 10, maybe kind of And so does a computer. I mean, it's it all of giga hash, so 10 to 9 calculations per second. But of course, there are many atoms of pair of atoms you have to calculate. So simulating seconds is not really feasible, but maybe there are no better computers that can get close to that, but you can simulate nanoseconds or micro, uh, milliseconds and so on. But it's, uh, but it's it feels a lot of calculations on big computers. But you can do that, and you can basically simulate the the how motion happens. And if you have like local things in picoseconds, it's like things are moving, you know, side chain flipping, and the vibrations and so on. Big emotions, uh, large structural arrangements. If you really want to have a full length of that, you need to go to microseconds, milliseconds time range, which is hardly is uh, 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 milliseconds are hard if you get on a computer. Me, microseconds maybe can do today if you are with lots of computers. And nanoseconds are more collective motion, maybe it will be a little bit uh, moving around this interaction. Slow motion, different time scales. And of course, this is all thermodynamics, so also this is, I guess, the energy. So the probability to pass over such a barrier is, of course, dependent on the temperature, and of course, the hydrogen barrier, but also it's a random process, so you have to wait until it happens. But once it happens, it can be a very, very fast transformation. So, uh, so this sort of slide sort of tries to summarize a lot of things that has been learned about protein folding, maybe experimentally or theoretically or simulations, but not the actual structure prediction for the last what, 50 years. <coughs> so we know somehow well, we know that, of course, that proteins have secondary structure elements. We know that the major force driving these secondary structure elements are the hydrogen bonds to the backbone. So it, 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 it here it's stable because it can fulfill the hydrogen bonds to the backbone, and it pretty much the same thing. But it's not because of the, that the hydrogen bonds are particularly strong. So that the the, the reason is why you, so why do you need to have secondary structures? Why don't you have an unfolded protein like that? And what, what happens to the hydrogen bonds if you don't have a secondary structure? Or the, the nitrogen and the oxygen to the backbone? How, well, how do you think, what do you think in, in the unfolded chain here? What do you think are happening to this nitrogen and oxygen? Are they binding something? Is it alone? Is it the backbone? You remember, this has to be in basically water. And water is extremely good as a hydrogen bond imparter. So basically every single hydrogen bond that is here, forming here, is compensated by hydrogen bonds in with water otherwise. So, the, so it's not that you gain a lot of energy by making a helix, because you can equally value by water, roughly the same kind of cost energy. But of course, if you would unfold something that is cannot hydrogen bond, you would lose the cost of it. So it really, you really have this, and this is one of 
way to fulfill all the honey bonds of, 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 of in a compact structure. So you need it to basically compensate or to not lose the cost for the backbones to higher bond water. So then that's why you have secondary structures, which basically to compensate, not lose the higher bonds, but otherwise would buy the water. And then you have secondary structures, and you know that there are a number of reasons why some amino acids like to be in, in, in sheets, some others in helixes, some it depends on the uh, entropy of the side chain, etc. And I mean, this is quite well understood. And you can, we know that we have machine learning methods that can predict this quite well, and so on. Uh, but then somehow, okay, folding doesn't look hard, maybe this is right, but, but then the next step of level is basically you have a tertiary structure. So basically, the secondary structure elements are forming a global structure, sort of global structure. So, what's, what, what is the driving force there? The hydro bonds? Is it magic? Exactly. Basically, the same way as if you have mixed oil and water, they don't mix very well, and some men in the analysis are hydrophobic. So they do, they, they, if you put them into water, the water cannot form nice hydrogen bonds around it. So you, they, there's a cost related to that. And uh, so basically, what you do here is to try to put the hydrophobic residues in the middle. So certainly, one driving force, for instance, for, for this is that you want to have that is here is here that is have hydrophobic side and, and, and the hydrophilic side. Because they're going to have hydrophobic side on the inside. So you can actually form secondary structures by just different frequencies of amino acids. So if you have every third residue being hydrophobic, that is kind of driving force of forming a helix because you're basically going to have a hydrophobic part of it. But basically, you have had to be this, you may have to hide that. And then, of course, there are interactions with your setup for the form for that structures. But this is not really actually, it's not, I mean, for many, many people thought of like, we can basically go from secondary structure to and then form the structure, and then form the tertiary structure, because, uh, well, they had an idea of basically putting it that. But that's not the way for them. For the force of the more like collapse of things, that these things are going to. Happening at the same time, the formula of secondary structures, some parts for the early and later on, and it's a bit different for the bottom. But anyhow, there is some mechanism that it sort of collapses. And certainly, probably, if you have an unfolded protein, it's not completely a random either, it's also going to have some kind of shape. The things that are very hydrophobic are going to stick together, anyhow. It's not going to pack in the same way. You're not going to, it's very costly, and it's a very, very, very high temperature. You're not going to have hydrophobic residues interact with water. Because basically, that's just Genetically impossible. But you can think about the protein here that's unfolded somehow, which basically means that you can have many different confirmations, not a single dominant confirmation. And then somehow you can fold, and you have folding intermediates. So it's some kind of okay hydrophobic packing, okay secondary structure, but made not perfect. Sometimes it's called molten globules. They are Really, are a bit, a bit more, it's a bit bigger, it's a bit more water inside, a bit more less com compact and so on, but it's sort of having a compact fashion way. And sometimes you need enzymes, chaperones, they get to cover up in this course, but there are a number of enzymes in the working me me mechanism that can um, take one part of the structure and basically unfold it a little bit and then so you can fold back easier. So there is an enzyme of folding. There are, I mean, some of them are proline isomated, so you have a proline that has two, uh, two different forms, and you have new, you this enzyme that can favor it isomerization there. But there are also forms form, form like a cage, so basically you, you put pro you get the protein inside and it sort of gets shielded from everything else, etc. But then you can also aggregate the other proteins. We call them amorphous aggregates. And this is becoming a hot field right now, because there are a lot of, it seems to be, a mix of these things with RNA that probably has a function in the, in, in the cell bodies. So they are just what we call P bodies. And are exactly the function is clear, but they are, they are sort of, they occur when a cell is stressed, they sort of can ha keep mRNA to be expressed later and so on. And they are, the, the physical chemistry basically is some kind of a amorphous aggregates. 
And by the, by the also the solid are like a form oligomers, but you can also form fibrous like things that they also aggregate things that, and these might be very hard to degrade and might kill the cells. So that's an important part of the And uh, and of course, proteins can also what we're looking at, but of course, can also be degraded. So if things there are mechanisms in the cells, so basically things that look wrong, like hair or hair, there are also other enzymes that degrade these proteins. So of course, this is a turnover process. And some things are also going to go wrong sometimes, and you don't want them to hang around in the cells forever, because it might cause damage. So this, this is the whole research field that I guess. Uh, well, for the biochemistry students, if you took the course in the fall, you need to leave it back, you might learn more about it. Uh, so th th this is just my physics. So this is, now we are computer scientists again. And we want to predict the structures. We don't care about physics, or maybe we do, but, but we don't really, so we have to. I mean, one, one thing we have to try to understand is what we want to understand this. So if it was understand by physics good enough, well enough, we could really try to put the computer model in it. And anything you understand, if you cannot, Use it, but uh, they, they don't really understand it. But we know from, uh, I guess, that the early issues that there are several subfields of protein structure prediction. You have about homology modeling. Basically, you, you search by some sequence method for protein, known protein structures that have the same, uh, that have similar sequences, and then you make a copy the coordinates and fix the things that are different. And this is, of course, works very well if the sequences are similar. There was for a long time something called threading, which is basically the same idea, but you use, instead of using sequence, you kind of use structural terms. With the re rise of the databases, uh, it doesn't really help much. The sequence database is so big, so if you just use the information the right way, they might more powerful. And then we have this is called Abinicio or de novo or structure for the folding methods basically that do not include homology information of these ones directly to predict structures. And then I guess later this week I think we're gonna hear about how to predict the quaternary structures, the docking proteins, which actually is quite a difficult problem unless you have a good template to base on. But basically here also do the same thing, you can use homology modeling, basically find a template. Or you can make two models and try to put them together. But it's, it's actually quite a different model. That we won't copy today. So what is our initial predictions? So of course if you, if you really would like to understand something, uh, we basically should try to understand the laws of physics. Before it's like what, what do we mean with laws of physics here even? So if you really I thought about more like a dynamics. Uh, I don't think I have <coughs> sometimes I have the time to show a, a YouTube video of program called Folding at Home, but basically, and uh, basically there are people doing molecular dynamics simulations of protein folding. There is one group that have uh, built a special purpose computer for Amazon that is much faster than everything else than uh, uh, for Basically, simulated protein folding. And they actually, it worked better than I, than I expected. But basically, for proteins that are very fast folding, and fast folding means that the, the native state has a very uh, clearly lower free energy than anything else. So there are small sort of fast folding proteins that are not too big, that don't need the chaperones. They can actually do a simulation of the folding quite well. But it's not in the physics, because you're like dynamics in all quantum effects. You really, you really have functions. So yeah. and, and they also need to play around a bit with the potential so to really get it to work well. <coughs> so basically, the method today, well, as mentioned, until recently, basically try to combine this kind of physics with some kind of statistics and uh, other types of not less direct physics. And now it's convex. Basically, what solved the problem, or had more or solved the problem, is these convex predictions. But I come back to that. Uh, so basically, the prediction problem is basically we want to predict the series back to the whole problem without any prior knowledge. 
And the idea is that you want to use it when you cannot do homoly modeling because basically you don't have the structure and so on. But it's also like you can think about even if you do homoly modeling, you might have a long loop, like, or like a small subdomain that's inserted, or some part that you can have homoly model. And uh, if you have the physics well, you can use the same methods to understand in that given all other constraints. Uh, and actually, it has been proven, we should maybe talk about it, but we're going to talk about it today, is if you do prudent design, or sometimes called invert to the folding problem. So basically, the, the, that's the problem when you want to. Uh, so basically, assume I want to have a protein that looks like that. And the question is, what sequence should I have here? I, you, you see, in the <coughs> folding, I take this sequence, how does it look like? Uh, does it look like that, like that, like that? The other question is, also, I have this structure, which of these sequences can fold this generated protein? Yeah, and actually, the problem is quite, from a methodological point of view, maybe the way to evaluate this is, is quite similar. And actually, the best group, uh, really the most impressive designs that have been during the last decade, is David Baker, who has been the, the development of the Rosetta folding program. And the reason, and it's one reason, why his methods work much better than anybody else, is actually because a step of his, his designs are to simulate the folding. Most other groups just take a structure and try to optimize the sequence. But it never check if this sequence then can fold up into the structure. So it might be tra trapped as an intermediate somewhere or times of aggregation and so on. But this, because they have a lot of computer power and they have a very good method to do that, they can actually stack, use that information to calculate that information into account also. But still, it's like, uh, so they have done hundreds of funny designs. They have big, like, building blocks, like, they use mechanical the things that design, uh, design new enzymes. Uh, a lot of it is uh, vaccine is a big design issue for them. On, on, so they are doing lots of different things there. Some of them are more about material sciences and so on. But it, it's a problem that has, that is related. So many of the methods we talk about today can be used there also. Because physics is basically, it's basically the same physical question we're trying to answer. So basically, you could think, of, if you see, look at the folding problem, you can think of it as sort of two different problems, or two alternative problems. And one basically, you define some kind of initial model. And basically, let's say, we have an energy function that can describe this landscape as good as possible. So basically we have, we know we are very good at describing the landscape, and basically then I hope to be able to fold, find this one here. By optimizing, using any trick you can think about by searching it. So certainly I have the same problems as the level false paradox. I can search all possible confirmations, but I can use any trick that has nothing to do with physics at all. I can use any trick for folding it. Alternative is basically what I can do is basically do molecular dynamics. I can build an accurate model, I can simulate it. The problem is that it's guessing for proteins that are not extremely fast folding, it's just too slow. Plus of course also sort of errors aggregate. So if you have a small error in the energy function and there are many of these interactions that error propagates is not certain, even if you have a lot of computer time that you could not work. And both these approaches have been tried, and my, for practical purpose, this one has been much more successful. So, well, as I said, folding at home is uh, the molecular dynamic approach. Right? Yeah, yeah, and, 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 uh, so there are several problems with using molecular dynamics. One of the problems is to use is, is that to well, my main point is that it takes long time to simulate it. Uh, 
One problem is water. Because if you do a simulation, you need to take into account all the physics. And you want to describe helicity, as I want mentioned over here. And if you want to describe helicity correctly, you need to have the water there. There are implicit water models, but you don't have to have the water as atoms. But so if you basically what you want to do, you want to take a protein and put it in a box. And 90% of the box will be water. So you explain most of the time, can get water water interactions. And water is actually a very complicated uh, liquid. It's very hard to simulate the record. So you need a good water model. This is one of the most difficult, pop, um, different uh, materials to simulate. Because it's really, water has very, it's complicated. Uh, but, uh, so, often you can skip the water, but then the models are not as good. Uh, but, these people, mm, wait, wait, uh, so this is was a project, uh, I guess it still is running, so there was um, so mainly Vidya Panda, who started doing distributed computing. So this is one, this is something was set at home, and this was something that was set at home, so basically, instead of running at one single big supercomputer, you ask all uh, teenagers around the world to let them uh, run this as a screen as a screensaver. So they actually managed to ship this on one of the PlayStations, so there was a part of the PlayStation, so everyone had a PlayStation then to run in the background. But in the other one, instead of having maybe tens of thousands of computers, you have millions of computers. And the trick is of course that these millions of computers are not connected very close to each other, so you had to divide the task into small parts that are kind of independent. So basically, you do, instead of doing one very, very, very long simulations, you do many simulations, start at the same position, and then now and then you collect them and you decide which one to continue on. Which is not that bad if you think about an energy, energy landscape. And we have over here. As I said before, to pass over a value here, the passing can be very fast, but the probability to pass is just dependent on how long time you simulate and how long time you are here. So if you do many, many simulations in the same barrier, it doesn't really matter if, as long as they are long enough so you can pass over this barrier, it doesn't really matter if you do one long simulation or if you do a million short simulations. As long as each is long enough to be able to pass the barrier, so there's some minimum time. So you can actually do very, very efficient, large-scale sampling on many machines. If you convince these people to spend their energy and uh, do the carbon dioxide uh, imprint properly. So you have to have some nice game or competition behind, otherwise you won't actually do that. But they are, they managed to do that. And what did they learn? So this is, and this is actually not from project home, this is not a simulation, it's a very, very small protein, I think it's like, uh, I don't know, protein D, something like, 15 uh, residues on this, it's very, very small. And then you have a landscape here describing the protein, and it's basically, the more blue this color is, the more, the more um, um, likely it will have low free energy. And on this axis here, the the basic region, basically how, how, how comp compact is the protein. So basically, if it's extended, it has a bigger basic region. If it's compact, it has a compact region. So the native structure is here. And basically, it's, it's just as compact as you can get, mainly. And on this axis, is the fraction of native contacts. So maybe you have this protein, you have, I don't know, 20 contacts between residues. And how many of these are found here. So here, half the contacts are fulfilled and half are not. It doesn't have to be the same half all the time, but it can be different halves. So if you do these big type of simulations, you can get kind of a free and mini landscape that sort of should correspond to something like that, but in two dimensions here. And you can see, of course, low energy is here. But for instance, you can see that you have, uh, uh, you start maybe with something extended, but it gets quite easy to get compact. But then, Okay, the right compact version is quite uh, difficult. Yes. Uh, I think in this case you side chain, or both. I, I don't know, but uh, side chains are sort of included. I don't know if it's both or young side chains. I don't know. Yeah. 
it doesn't, well, the back of high demand would not be enough because that would only tell you the problem secondary structure. So it has to be the long range information in context also. And uh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't remember exactly how to define it, but it's the, it could be atom level or rational level, I don't remember. But probably it's all the atom context, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So basically, what it means is that a protein can get quite it's going to be compact, but then it takes quite a long time for it to find the exact activation. It's kind of vibrate, it has to unfold a little bit, and has to move on side chains from each other. You can think about if you have two side chains that are packed like that, but it should be packed like that. Because they pass through each other, the reader has to unfold and to fold back. So there's a, there's a lot of, so you can, you can look at the simulation and you see a lot of things like that that are happening. So this kind of simulation gave the idea, so we had this kind of, they still like, they had this idea of kind of folding funnels. So you have things here that you start with pages and you start getting there. And uh, you have a large page where you are sort of half folded, but it's not always the same half, it's like in different halves. There's some contents that are more likely to occur there, some are less likely, and so on, but it's not only one pathway involved, you can follow many different pathways, and end up at the end of the native structure. I wonder if you should look at this. Thing here. I do open link. Available in my country. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then I think this is not so important. But basically, yeah, you, you, can, you can probably, if you if you go with a folding at home, you will basically find it. Find my way, find my way back. Mm. So yeah, I mean, I think we have enough time to do that anyway. But basically, if you're used to us, I think you can get change it. But you can look at folding at home and basically have a simulation on all the I can tell you, just see if I can find it after the break. Uh, I think there's something more to say here. Well, there's two more things. I can, I, I, I'll put it on the run during the break. Basically, as I said, yeah, there are problems. The energy factors are maybe not perfect. Better than I thought it would be. And the problem is water. You actually you need to include water to do something really good. Uh, what is this? Uh, So basically, the point here is that f is folding in a simulation is time consuming and it's a bit hard to solve it. It's been done. But after the break, I will try to give you a first small video that I will show you the solution to this problem, or the Rosetta problem. And I did one, one day, and the idea is basically that you sort of divide the problem into, you don't care about the really physics, you said you divide, divide the problem into two parts. So you have the global problem is dominated by hydrophobicity, and then the local preferences is dominated by hydrophobes, so, or some kind of secondary structure preference. And you represent them with those fragments. But and, uh, ah, we don't have to break, so let's try to be back here uh, too. And I'll find this video.